Whenever you think about what Abram and Sarai were told to do, what they did, and how many ways that they messed up and the people around them and they themselves caused such problems. Infertility. It is a hard thing. As most of you are aware, we've all known people in our lives that have struggled with having children and have you know, been blessed to be able to adopt and to be able to love the children that were eventually put into their lives. Sarah truly believes there's no chance that she's going to have this kid, no matter whether God told her or not that she would. Now, Abram, it was accounted to him as righteousness, as righteousness for believing the promises of God. And that's the same way with us as we believe the promises that Jesus made to us as his righteousness. Well, Abram decides that, well, maybe this is how it will be fulfilled. If Sarah's okay with it, then I'll be okay with it. But as we know, surrogates are not always a good thing. And this is the first surrogate that we see of. And it is a horrible thing. Hagar decides that she's going to torment Sarai, her master. Sarai can't take it. And hate just abounds, doesn't it? They're both tormenting the other and they're tormenting each other so badly that they both want the other when God. And of course, who has the rights? Sarai. So, Abram tells her, it's your servant. Do with it as you do with her as you will. You already have been doing with her as you will. You're the one that said for her to, for the child to be born through her. And that you would claim it. Do with her as you would please. She treats her horribly, and she runs away. We'll see more of Hagar's story next week. But now we come to Jesus. Weddings are great things, aren't they? We enjoy the time with family and friends. It's a wonderful time. And Jewish weddings are really special times. They're week-long feasts. Okay? Our weddings, you know, we typically have the ser service and, you know, we uh, then have all of our things and it lasts, okay, you know, even if you care all the prep and everything and the cleanup and everything afterwards, our weddings last about 24 hours, right? You know, if you count everything and all that stuff in that whole day. Well, the Jewish wedding goes on for a week and they've been invited to this wedding. Now, apparently, more people came to it than what the planners had planned for. Because if you're supposed to be in a week-long celebration, then you run out of wine in what seems like the first day, right? It says they're all there, and all of a sudden, they're out, and Jesus is being pestered by his mother. She knows that Jesus has come to do amazing things. She knows that God's prophecy said that he would come so that joy can be made complete. And she knew that Jesus had this ability in him to do amazing things. The apocryphal works of his infancy are filled with amazing stories and his young adult days are just filled with all kinds of tales. So Mary has seen some amazing things that he can do. And he says, it's not time. And she says, yes, it is. Do whatever he tells you to do. Now, he could have just told them, okay, get all the old wine skins and go fill them up with water. He doesn't do that. He could say, do this, do that. And by the way, we're going to set him in the middle of the room so everybody knows what I'm doing. He didn't do that. But he picks 
the purification jars. Now he also knows that these purification jars are going to be what? Clean, right? These jars are going to be so clean they will have no residues of anything in them. They will not be like some outside trough that has all the dust and the leaves and the debris of the day falling into it. These are 20 to 30 gallon jars so that people can purify themselves, so that they can eat, so that they can pray, so that they can go to temple. These are very, very, very important things. And Jesus says, fill them up. And so they did. He doesn't make a big scene over it. In fact, we don't even have Jesus praying over it. Nothing. Other than him just telling them to draw some out and take it to the chief steward of the feast. Now, the chief steward of the feast had to have known they were out of wine. He had to have known that something was up because it's his job to make sure all the pitchers are constantly filled. And he tastes this wine and it's better than anything he's ever experienced. And it's an amazing thing. He's shocked by it, in fact. He says, this is so good, how can it be saved towards the end? Now, that makes it sound like you're in the last days of the wedding feast. But Jesus did what? If he took six jars that, came, that contained between 20 and 30 gallons of water, and turned between 20 and 30 gallons of water, into wine in six jars. Jesus made somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of wine. That's an amazing thing. Now that sounds like what it would take to party on a week, right? It really does. I mean, come on, let's face it. If you've how many of us have, 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 had, have, have noticed the, uh, ever, ever seen the actual alcohol bill in a party? At a wedding, have you seen it? It's a huge thing, isn't it? Yes. You spend weeks and weeks trying to collect all of it, right? As you prep and, and do these things. That's what these people had done, and they really thought they prepared for it. We do that too, don't we? We think we've prepared for things. We think that we've got our heart prepared for this or our heart prepared for that. We think we've got our homes prepared for this or prepared for that. And then all these things happen in life and life transpires and we find out we're not as prepared as we thought that we were. Just like the people at the wedding feast. Well, that's the good news about Jesus. He wants us to always be prepared, and that's the great thing with us as being Christians. He goes everywhere with us. So that no matter where we are, He is always doing things trying to make our joy complete. Just like He did at this wedding. The joy was complete, right? Went out of His way to just make sure that it would be taken care of in a mighty and amazing way, and that it would last for as long as it's needed. That's what he does with us when he pours his spirit out upon us. It is with us and remains with us for as long as it is needed. And how long is that? For eternity. Amen? Right? I mean, seriously, it goes with us throughout eternity. Now, we forget that, and we like to think that we do these things. I saw something on Facebook. Um, I can't remember who shared it, and who shared it, from who shared it, from who shared it. But it talks about the fact that we go to sleep every night believing that we'll have another day. It's a 
wonderful thing. We do, don't we? We go to sleep every night believing we will have another day. How many of us are guaranteed that day? None of us, right? Yet we go to bed every night believing that God is going to see us through that night and give us another day. That is faith. That is hope. That is promise. We believe the promises that God gave, gives us. Sometimes we believe them more than others, don't we? Sometimes we trust on them more than other times. But in all times, that's where we should be living. Today, we get to celebrate communion once again. That sacrament of continuous, continuance. It is the sacrament where, G, where we take Jesus' body and blood into us and we ask him to make us more like him. We ask him to forgive us, to wash us, to make us his. We ask him to forgive us for those times that we fall down. And we ask him to carry us through each day, through each moment. It's the great thing of communion. If you would, let us turn in our hymnals to page 11, or actually to page 7, for our communion liturgy this morning. And that's one of the good things about communion in the United Methodist Church. We have it open to all. All who earnestly repent of their sins are reminded that the Lord's table is always open to those who love Him, to those who live to seek in peace with one another, and those who earnestly repent of their sins. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. If our ushers would come forward at this time.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate the sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself for us, he took bread, he broke it, he passed it amongst the disciples and said, Take and eat all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it. He passed it amongst the disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. May them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We are serving through intention this morning, which means I will take a piece of bread and hand it to you, and then you will dip it in the cup and consume them both at that time. If you would come forward at this time.
If you would, let us turn our blue folders to our closing hymn. They will know we are Christians by our love. Found on page 24.